It used to be that when people thought of long-range quadcopters, they thought of big 7-inch, 10-inch, 13-inch props with gigantic batteries that could fly for 20, 30 minutes or more. But Dave C., a pilot and designer, I don't know what you want to call him, Dave C. had the idea that you could build a smaller, lighter, 4-inch long-range quadcopter and get just about the same flight time, but with less on the line when you crash because you can build a four inch a lot cheaper than you can build a seven inch. And you can run it for a long time on a lot smaller battery because it's a lot smaller and lighter. And with modern control links like Crossfire and DJI, you can still fly for a freaking long range. Oh my God, what a great idea. And that is why I'm going through a whole bunch of these long range four inch quadcopters on my channel. Today, we're looking at the Diatone Roma F4 long range. But I have also looked at the Flywheel Explorer, the Gepar C Baby Croc, the iFlight Chimera, and one more that I still have to do, the Catalyst Machine Works Shocker. I've got reviews of all of these on my channel. There's a playlist in the video description. When you get done with this one, you can go check them out. Or if you're the kind of person who just likes it all summed up for you, as soon as I finish reviewing the Catalyst Machine Works Shocker, I'm then going to do a roundup where I try to just cut to the chase and go through the pros and cons of all of them. Yeah. So get subscribed and hit the notification bell if you want to make sure you don't miss that when it comes out. But today we are looking at the Diatone Roma F4 LR and we're just going to kind of take this as it is without doing too many direct comparisons because that's a rabbit hole that we could spend a long time on and that's going to be its own video. I'm Joshua Bardwell. This is the Diatone Roma F4 LR and you're going to learn something today. The first thing I notice about the Diatone Roma F4 LR is the camera. Now, it won't surprise many of you to learn that they sent me the DJI version. Everybody is sending out the DJI gear for review because because that's just what they're doing. So if you're an analog pilot, this does come in an analog version. They, they pretty much all do, but we're gonna be reviewing the DJI one. And unfortunately, it has come with the Cadex Nebula camera. Now, thankfully, it has come with the Cadex Nebula Micro and not the Nebula Nano. The Nebula Nano is the lightest DJI setup you can get, but the image quality is really poor. I think that the Nebula Micro should have better image quality, but I actually haven't tested it or flown it, so I'm going to find out for myself. I really wish they were sending it with the Vista camera, and frankly, Many of these products were listed as having the Vista camera, and then the manufacturer just started shipping Nebulas, sometimes without even updating the product listing. I'm not, not pointing at Diatone here, but I think the reason for that is that Vistas were out of stock for a long freaking time. Nobody really seems to know why. Caddox just stopped making them. Hopefully, by the time you see this, it will be sold with the Nebula, or the Vista again, and everything will be fine. The motors are 1404 in size, and 3000 KV, and that is pretty much the standard size and KV for this category. The flight control stack is the Diatone Mamba F405 Mini. This is a 20 millimeter stack. It does stand out there compared to the 16 millimeter stack used on the Flywoo Explorer. I think that's gonna be it, give it a little more durability, especially the 20 millimeter ESC, especially if you end up doing something like turtle motor or whatever. Um, 20 millimeter ESCs in general, I think are less durable than 30 millimeter ESCs, but I feel like for this lightweight build with smaller motors and smaller props, this is probably a fine combination. The Diatone flight controller is very, very good. I'm a big fan of the Diatone Mambo lines. They tend to have good uh, pad layout, lots of UARTs and so forth. Uh, we'll check the exact capabilities of this one when we get to the beta flight. We'll look at the beta flight configuration a little later in the video. One thing that does stand out is that they've shipped it with this plug. This plug is for the receiver. So I guess this is the plug and play version of the quad. It didn't come with any receiver, but I'm a little surprised because I mean, a lot of people are gonna be using it with the DJI controller, in which case you don't need to install a receiver. If that's you, then I guess you're just gonna be desoldering this yourself. If you do need to install a receiver, it's pretty nice. Diatone ships it with a cable like this. So for example, this is for the RXSR, and it'll just plug straight into the RXSR and plug into that. There's, there'll be a no solder install. I've always noted, and Diatone still 
hasn't fixed this, uh, that it does, the, the plug and play version doesn't support smart port telemetry. I wish they would add another pin to their flight controller so you could get smart port telemetry with the same wire, but oh well, telemetry is not absolutely mandatory. It also comes with a version of the plug that you can direct solder. If you're using Crossfire, this is what you could use. Or of course, you could just cut the plug off and solder it directly if you, if you prefer to. Camera mounting is one of those areas of the frame that I always feel like I, I wanna pay close attention to, especially on freestyle builds where you're gonna be crashing head on into things. The ability to protect the camera while giving you the flexibility to mount the camera exactly how you want is an area where the frame designer can really show their merit. Uh, in this case, I think Diatone has done a great job. We've got a metal front end, which is gonna do a great job protecting the camera, obviously, better than like just carbon fiber plates. Uh, the camera can be mounted forward or backward using this, uh, this mounting hole here, and you can see there's different cutouts to sh so you can set the angle depending on which camera you choose to use. You've also got the option to move it down. So I don't know why only the center one you can move it down. That's an interesting choice. I'm not sure what that's for. But if you're using a nano size camera, if you're using a larger camera or a camera of different sort of thickness or depth, you have the option to move it exactly how it needs to be so that it will be protected by the cage, but not so far back that it has the cage in view. The frame uses a split bottom plate design. Uh, we're seeing a lot of frames do this these days. The Impulse RC Apex comes to mind. Some people have told me that the Reverb was actually the first frame to do this. Uh, in this design, there is a front half of the bottom plate that goes all the way to the camera cage and a back half of the bottom plate that goes all the way to the rear. And those two pieces together sandwich the arms. Sandwiching the arms is really important because if there's not two plates sandwiching the arms, then when the arms take a hit, they flex and there's only that little, you know, 1.5 or two millimeter piece of carbon and it easily flexes and gets stressed and breaks. When you've got them sandwiched, there's a lot more resistance to those stresses. Um, a lot of frames would just use an X plate on the bottom with a single bottom plate, but the disadvantage of that is that you then lose room at the front because that bottom plate comes all the way through and you don't have enough place to put your camera. So this split deck bottom plate design gives you enough room to put a micro-sized camera in with a lot of flexibility while still giving you the advantages of kind of a slam deck design throughout the rest of the frame, uh, centralized center of mass and so on. As you would probably expect, the arms are interchangeable. If you break one and they fit together, it's interesting how they come together. Yeah. I see what you got going there. They don't really interlock, but they do press up against each other. And they have, I mean, I, they just don't have any movement at all, though I am kind of flexing the arm itself. Um, two screws to remove it. Interesting that they're two different screws. Okay, fair enough. One's a cap, one's a button. Um, these are not stack screws, so you do not have to, t these are the stack screws right here. So you do not have to take uh, the stack screws out in order to change an arm if you were to break one. I'm also noticing that this bottom plate on the rear here has a cutout that certainly saves weight and probably gives the Vista a little more airflow to stay cool. That is a nice touch. Looking closer at the stack mounting, we've got 20 millimeter mounting screws here and there's mounting holes also for a 25 millimeter all-in-one toothpick flight controller here and you kind of can't see it on camera, but there's a, a pass-through hole here. Very good on Diatone for making all these screws accessible when the frame is fully assembled. I know that seems like a given, but it's it's not actually always true. Impulse RC Apex, I'm looking at you. On the back here, we've got the GPS hanging off. It looks like it's probably a BN180. Yeah, confirmed, BN180. This 3D printed piece also has a cutout for a Crossfire antenna, if you prefer. Mm. It's not, it's, it's not filling me with a ton of confidence there, folks. It's basically held on just by this two millimeters of, of TPU. And I know I said, oh, it's not first and foremost designed for bando bashing, but like, and I guess they're saving weight. It seems a little, it seems a little flexy to me. Hey there folks, Joshua from the future here with one other note. I didn't notice this when I was doing the bench review, but then when I went to fly, it jumped out at me. Do you see how there's a little 3D printed piece? Uh, it's the rear antenna holder for the Vista antenna and it extends forward 
it's sitting on top of the Vista, sandwiched between the Vista and the top plate. Well, the presence of that piece means that you cannot run a battery strap through that location. So basically you can only run a battery strap in front of that standoff. If you wanted to run a battery strap further back or if you wanted to run a second battery strap, it's not really gonna work. Looking at the accessories that come with the quad, Diatone has included a couple of GoPro mounts. I think this is a GoPro mount. What kind of GoPro mounts on this mount? I don't recognize this mount. They are injection molded. They're not 3D printed. So kudos, that's cost them a lot of money. Uh, and they mount in a really clever way. There's this little tab that goes back through here and then you screw down the screws right here. So it seems pretty secure. Um, including a full-size GoPro mount, kind of gutsy. I mean, you can put a GoPro 9 or Hero 8 or something on this. It's pretty heavy. Um, maybe if you pull the battery out and run it off five volt through the USB, but I imagine they wouldn't have included if they didn't intend for you to use it. So that's really interesting. And they also include a buzzer that you have to solder up yourself. Obviously, I would rather have the buzzer. I would rather have the buzzer come pre-soldered, and I would rather have a uh, self-powered buzzer in case you lose it. But uh, you know, there you go. Now let's go over to the computer. We'll finish the setup of this guy and we'll take a look at the configuration that Diatone has given us and see if there's anything that I would change. Yeah, that sounds about right. If you're using the DJI controller and you wanna see a complete tutorial for how to set up one of these quads for the first time, I've got another one I did with the GEPRC Rocket Lite and I'll link it down in the video description. It's not the exact same quad you're using, but it turns out that setting up most of these DJI quads is pretty much the same because the DJI system is where most of the work is. So that tutorial will probably work for you. On the other hand, if you're not using the DJI controller and you're using something like the RadioMaster TX16S, I'm going to give you a link to a different tutorial, again, down in the video description. Again, it is not the exact same thing that we've got here, but hopefully it'll get you moving in the right direction. So let's take a look at what we got. They are using DShot 300. Very interesting. Um, again, DShot 600, a little higher performance, but probably not necessary for a cruiser style. Uh, it, I'm going to guess that's because, yeah, that must be because they're using bi-directional DShot and on an F4 processor, you need to use DShot 300 and a 4K PID loop if you're using bi-directional DShot and RPM filtering. RPM filtering is, I think, very, very worth the trade-off of the slower DShot and the lower PID loop. It gives a much better flying quad in just basically every case. I'm happy to see that they've set the arming angle to 180 to allow the quad to arm even when it is not perfectly flat and level. I do that on all of my quads. It is a safety feature, but I, I, I find it more annoying than helpful, and uh, I agree with this decision. They are shipping it with air mode disabled. However, they do have air mode as an aux mode that you can turn it on or off. Some people prefer to do this because it lets you turn air mode off when you're coming in for a landing or if you're gonna do a perch. My personal preference is to have air mode on all the time and I'm gonna go ahead and change that. Um, that's not a wrong decision on Diatone's part. It's just a preference of mine. They've also set the motor beacon to number five. Uh, there are five different motor, oh, so back up. Motor beacon means that when you activate the buzzer, if you don't have a buzzer on the quad, which this quad doesn't ship with a buzzer installed, the motors will just go beep, 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 just like when you first plug them in. Um, there are five different tones. Tone number one is just beep, 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 and tone number five is like bleh, bleh. Every time I hear number five, I think my quad is broken and about to explode. I'm gonna use number one Number five is a little easier to hear, but it just drives me crazy and I hate it. So I'm gonna change it to number one. If you install a buzzer on your quad, you can go ahead and turn these two options off and you'll have the buzzer instead of the motor beacon. Here in the power and battery tab, I'm going to suggest that if you're gonna be using high volt batteries, which charge to 4.35 volts, you change the maximum cell voltage to 4.4. If you don't intend to use any high volt batteries, you can leave that at the default. Uh, there's no harm in doing this. It's just that maximum cell voltage is how the flight controller determines how many cells your battery has. If you leave that at 4.3 and you plug in a high volt at 4.35, it will think your 4S is actually a discharged 5S and be confused. So uh, the warning cell voltage you may also want to change if you are going to be flying these lithium ion packs that you can run down to 3.0 volts or even a little lower. You may want to change the warning cell voltage down from 3.5 to maybe 3.2 or even 3.0. Um, 
Again, if you don't intend to fly these, the default to 3.5 is fine. And don't worry, this warning does not cause the quad to like fall out of the air or disarm. It just flashes in the on-screen display or starts beeping at you when the voltage goes below this level. Since I do intend to fly this with lithium ions, I'm going to change this down to 3.0, but I will need to keep an eye out when I'm running lipos because you could, if you just charge a lipo to 3.0, you're going to have a bad time. Here in the failsafe tab, there's really nothing remarkable. They have got the failsafe set to the standard drop where the quad will just disarm. Even though the quad does have a GPS on it, they have not set it to GPS rescue. That's not a right or a wrong decision, but many people would assume that if it's got a GPS, it's going to have GPS rescue as its failsafe. Um, the way they're shipping it now, you can activate GPS rescue with an aux switch but if you fail safe, it will fall out of the sky. I'm going to set it to GPS rescue. And if you want more information, I, I, I don't actually always use the default GPS rescue configuration. I have a whole nother video I made where I go in depth on the GPS rescue configuration and why I set mine up the way that I do. And I'm going to link that in the video description and you can check that out. Well, folks, the situation got even weirder because when I looked in the ports tab, it turned out that the GPS on the Diatone Roma is not even activated by default when they ship it. So that does explain why failsafe was not set to GPS rescue, but why would you ship a quad with a GPS unit installed and not have the GPS actually working out of the box? Well, I asked Diatone that exact question and their answer is basically that the GPS wasn't working consistently, so they disabled it. There is down in the video description, a command line dump that you can paste in and it will activate your GPS. But I mean, <laughs> Why not just make it work right? Why is it not working? It's working for other units. I mean, I guess the Flywheel Explorer, the GPS didn't work that great and they shipped it. Uh, it just seems to me like either take the damn thing off or make it work, but don't ship it with the GPS installed, but not working. Okay. Here in the PID tuning tab, it is nice to see that Diatone has got some custom PIDs in here. Are they good? Are they bad? We'll see when we fly the quad, but it's, it is nice. I mean, the default PIDs fly great. I would not criticize anyone for shipping a ready to fly with default PIDs, but usually you can make them fly a little better. And it's always nice to see the manufacturer put in the effort. Um, in the filter settings, they've also made some changes and this is pretty weird. They've actually lowered the gyro filter multiplier. So they actually got a little more filtering than standard. I guess in theory that can make it fly smoother or something, but it, it never is a good sign to me when you need more filtering than the defaults. My usual interpretation is that means there's something mechanically wrong with the quad, like it has too much vibration or too much, not enough capacitors or something. Well, again, we'll see how this flies and we'll see if we have any complaints. Now it's time to show you how this quadcopter flies. And before I do that, there are a couple changes I make to the Cadex Vista on all my quads. Number one, I turn off temperature protection. Wait, don't you need temperature protection to keep it from overheating? It turns out that if it overheats enough, it still shuts down anyway. But a lot of times the temperature protection will get cause problems for you. Like for example, you can't start the DVR until you arm the quad. And as soon as, anyway. So I turn temperature protection off. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the output power to the maximum possible and no, that is not 700 milliwatts. There is a hack you can do to unlock up to 1200 milliwatts. And I've got another video showing how to do that hack. Once you do the hack on your goggles, then you can set all your air units and vistas to 1200 milliwatts. And I like to run it the maximum possible output power, which is a thousand milliwatts in the United States. That's legal. It was not legal to go to 1200. So that's definitely what I'm doing. Now we are flying with the Cadex Nebula. This is the first time I've flown with the Nebula uh, Micro instead of the Nebula Nano. It seems better. It's not as good as the Vista in my opinion, but better. One of the things about the Nebula is that you are locked to 16.9 widescreen. You do not have the option to change to 4.3 and you do not have any of the options to change the camera settings like brightness, contrast, and so forth. Ah. So this is basically what you see is what you get. I hope they start shipping with the Vista soon. The first thing I'd like to show you is just a little bit of light acro. You can do light acro with these. I just see some instability Oh yeah, it's kind of, when you punch that throttle, it's kind of all over the place. I also see some kind of bobbling. 
the motors sound a little rough. I have to I have to admit when I uh, did the arm test and the failsafe test with props off, the motors sound a little rough. That may explain why they've turned down the gyro filtering too. A little bit of extra. I mean, maybe the bearings aren't so great in the motors. If we go slow, how does the horizon look? Does the horizon look pretty stable? I see a little bobbling on the horizon. Oh yeah. I mean, if I can see it here while I'm flying, it's gonna look even worse than the DVR. Oh yeah, a little twitchy. It's not particularly windy today either. Oh yeah, mm. that's too bad. Now we're gonna fly up to the ridge. We're gonna do uh, basically a range test here. Um, but it's kind of, I mean, we kind of know what to expect. I do have the Lumineer Axie HD goggles, uh, the, the, the patch antenna on the goggles. So we're gonna get a little more range than you would get if you had the standard Omni antennas only. I got a video about the Axie HD. I'll, I'll put a link in the video description if you wanna check that out. They give a little more range. Um, a bit rate's hanging in at 50 megabits per second. The RSSI in the lower left is going up and down, but as long as you got a good bit rate, you're, you're, you're good. Like I'm at 50 megabits per second, even though I'm seeing only two bars. Like, I'm just good. I don't know why I'm seeing two bars. Oh, Jello City. Wow, Jello's tastic. Je wow, wow. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is with DJI. Like, you'll see 40, 50 megabits per second, but you'll have zero bars. And it's like, well, am I about to fail safe or aren't I? I do have focus mode on right now, so if the edges of the screen look a little blurry, that is why. I normally turn focus mode off because I prefer to have a consistent screen. In addition, the Cadex Nebula can only be flown in high quality mode. It cannot be flown in low latency mode. So, um, especially with it being winter, not being able, with no leaves on the trees, I'm at an increased risk of smacking a branch. And uh, the nebula is definitely not helping. See that bobble? And I might say, oh, that's Betaflight 4.2's low throttle bobble, but this is 4.1. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, as soon as you start pushing it into any kind of acro, it really just falls apart. Like if I'm a little gentle on the sticks, I have a bobble there, bobble there, jerks and bobbles and shakes. Oh my goodness, and wait a minute. Oh, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not great. Flight time, in, as, as with all of these, flight time is insane. We're at uh, oh, seven minutes now. We're down to 3.6 volts. This is a, oh, just all over the place. As soon as you touch the throttle. Oh, man. Maybe raise the idle speed. Just every time you touch the throttle, it, it's, it's bad. Okay, see that bobbling there? And you can certainly say, oh, well, this is not made for acro, it's a cruiser, but the, some of the others in this category definitely can acro. Well, that's gonna bring us to the end of this video, and as always, the question, should you buy it? And to get the ultimate answer to that question, you're gonna have to wait for the shootout where I round up all these guys Make sure you're subscribed and hit the notification bell so you don't miss it. Um, it's, I'm planning on having it out by the end of this week. If it's the future, then it's probably already out. Check the playlist in the video description, which has all the reviews of all of these quads and, uh, and that roundup video when it's finally out. But I have to say, Diatone, I usually really love their stuff.
I usually want to love their stuff, and sometimes I do, but then sometimes I find things to criticize about it that give me real reservations. The Diatone GT369, amazing quad, and then like the third crash, the ESC blew up, and I was like, Diatone, ah, so close. The Diatone uh, Falco X a Micro, I remember the name of that one. Oh, it was so good. And then turtle mode killed the ESC. And they were like, don't turtle mode. And I was like, are you really? The Diatone M515, sub 250 gram, five inch on 1806 motors. Very good. First crash, 1806 motor shaft bent. So, yeah. This one I feel like is shaping up. Like it's not bad, but there are better out there. The instability at, at in flight Maybe it could be tuned a little better, but if you're talking just the out-of-the-box experience, mm, frame seems pretty good. I don't know. This is a pretty competitive category, and I'm not sure this one is going to rise to the top. But if you decide that you do want to check it out online, there are links to it in the video description, and they are affiliate links, and that means that if you make any purchase after you click one of those links, just click the link, go to the store, fill up your shopping cart, check out, I get a small commission, and it definitely helps me out, it costs you nothing. Looking forward to getting the review of the Catalyst Machine Works Shocker, and uh, the final roundup. Thank you guys so much for watching. Happy fly. You guys, I don't know where I am, and I, I don't know what's gonna happen, but if I don't make it out of this, I just wanna know that you subscribe to my channel, or, or maybe join my Patreon, or, or click, one of, click one of these videos I picked out for you. <laughs>